At many gatherings at Stanford, we take a moment to acknowledge the story and significance of the land on which the university sits and the responsibility of stewardship across generations. This show of respect reminds us of Stanford's connection to Ohlone lands and peoples and encourages ongoing engagement among our communities. Here to present the land acknowledgement is Hannah Gonzalez, a member of the JD class of 2023. Stanford sits on the ancestral lands of the Muwekmo Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge, honor, and make visible the university's relationship with Native peoples. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I have the honor of officially welcome you to this joyous day when we graduate the class of 2023. This year, we graduate 271 students, 177 JD students, 85 LLM students, seven JSM students, and two JSD students. We're all here to mark a milestone in the lives of our graduates and their families and to celebrate their exceptional achievement made all the more significant by the way this JD class began their law school journey. In August 2020, today's JD graduates arrived to a law school very different from the one they expected when they applied for law school. The first year of law school is, both in expectation and reality, a time to develop community, to learn how to read cases, to think and analyze issues in a different way, to develop one's sense of a self as an advocate and professional. The class of 2023 had to do all of this largely alone in their rooms, connecting with each other by Zoom, a daunting and imperfect introduction to law school. During the class of 2023's first year here, we held office hours and some classes outdoors, sometimes in wildfire smoke and rain. Mostly classes, events, and programs were limited and virtual. It was not into well into 2021 that Zoom classes became mostly a thing of the past and we returned to our classrooms. Over the next two years, things gradually settled back into the normalcy that our students expected. But the memory of that first year is, for many, not a fond, fond one and likely indelible. I want to recognize what this class of JD students in particular has endured and the strength that came from that experience. You have emerged from these years with resilience and a greater appreciation for the importance of community. I hope that all of you recognize the value of these traits and the strength that you built during your challenging and very unusual time at Stanford Law School. Graduations mark both conclusions and beginnings. You can now close this chapter of experiences that you had here at SLS and look toward your new careers and life post law school with optimism. I want to make sure we all acknowledge everyone who played a role in supporting you as you made your way to this moment of celebration today. Let me extend a warm welcome to the family, friends, and loved ones of our graduates. You've supported the students you are here to celebrate in long years of education, through stress over applications, late night phone calls as they worried over a research paper, meals lovingly made for them as they studied for an exam, for our international students, the goodbyes in the airport as they set off for California for an unknown experience. Those moments of parting have now come to fruition as you can celebrate their achievements today. Your love and support is what brought all of them to this moment and must be celebrated as well. You graduates would not be at this moment today without the dedication and enormous support of your family, friends, and loved ones. You also got today with the help of our incredible faculty who are at Stanford Law School because they love teaching and preparing you for lifelong learning and careers of meaning and impact. 
They've taught you in the classroom, met with you in office hours, labored with you over your brief in clinic late into the night, given you handwritten comments on the 13th draft of your dissertation, glowed with pride as they watched you present your policy lab findings to a room full of government officials, talked with you about your career goals, called judges to recommend you for clerkships, championed you in fellowship applications, handed you the tissue box when you cried in office hours, and tried to help you make sense of the challenging world we live in and your place in it. I also want to thank our hardworking, devoted staff who never ever get enough credit for what they do to make Stanford Law School the amazing place that it is. Every single day during your time here, the staff have been working in ways both visible and invisible to make sure that you got through law school and to this moment in which you are prepared to launch into your careers. I'm grateful for all our staff do, as are all of us here. Graduates, you know that you did not get here alone and you did not get through this alone. Please take a moment now to thank those who've helped you make it to this day. Let me end my welcome by saying to today's graduates that I hope you're feeling gratitude to those who've gotten you here today, but I hope you feel more than that. I hope you're feeling the pride that your family and loved ones feel and that all of us who work here at the law school feel. In your time at Stanford Law School, you've mastered so much more than legal doctrine. You've learned how to see both sides of an argument, how to represent the interests of a client with zeal and diligence. You've learned to negotiate and compromise while staying true to your values. You've organized events and conferences and speakers, delivered policy research to lawmakers, and you've thrown yourself into this community and this university in ways that have forever changed us. You've pushed us to be better than we were before. So yes, do feel gratitude, but feel pride as well. Congratulations. fellow graduates and faculty, family and friends that came all that travel across the world to be here, welcome to Stanford. This, <laughs> this incredibly perfect campus that sometimes feels like Disneyland for nerds. <laughs> Why the campus may be the first hit, don't be fooled. The hidden gem is us, the community we built here. I'm sure that Eduardo and Royce will do a tremendous job addressing the perks and struggles of life at Stanford Law School. So I'd like to take this opportunity to address a particular factor of the LLM and SPUS programs. We gather here as outstanding legal practitioners from 27 different countries, ranging from Honduras to the Philippines, passing through Kenya and Kazakhstan, we are the true meaning of diversity. No wonder, <laughs> no wonder our happy birthdays last 30 minutes. <laughs> However, it's not only geographical diversity that defines us. It's also the paths that led us here. Judges from South Korea and the Netherlands, a commissioner of Brazil's central bank, Partners of leading law firms in India and Brazil, Supreme Court Clerk of Israel, the list goes on. After years fighting the good fight, we all felt a restless feeling for change. And let me assure you, it takes a great deal of courage to leave a promising career path and go back to being a student, a person with no income. <laughs> But we are, her, we are hungry to learn again, and male deals have we learned. 
We foster our interests and develop our skills with the sharpest minds of the top one law school in the U.S. I could have a full speech about the academic excellence of Stanford Law School and how much I, we, appreciate the privilege of learning with and from all of you. We also had the bonus of delving deeply into each other's cultures. It, begins, it began with the small things, national festivity, foods, and of course profanities, or how to not toast in Japanese. <laughs> but it extended far beyond that. We discovered how differently women, homosexuals, and elders are treated, respected in each of our countries. We explored the various meanings and manifestations of freedom and democracy, pushing us to reframe our roles as lawyers and lawmakers. More importantly, we learned to look beyond our differences. Our backgrounds, and let's face it, we all had our, our misconceptions. Our backgrounds, opportunities, and interests shape those biases. But we learned that what truly matters is the intention to sincerely connect to, with respect and an open heart. A virtue that is especially important in today's world where a twisted sense of, sense of moral and intellectual superiority is leading us to burn instead of building bridges. I feel so happy and feel immensely pride, privileged to have made friends from all over the world. Overcoming cultural barriers that at a first glance would seem too big. But guess what? They are never too big, never. I'll miss this and I'll miss you so, so much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there's more, there's more. <laughs> Thank you for the honor of choosing me to speak on your behalf in such a special moment. And before we rush to the next chapter of our lives or bar preps, I want you, my dear friends, to remember two things and to accept a challenge. First, you made it. In fact, you had already made it even before setting foot on this campus. Don't believe me? Look to the person next to you. Consider the incredible journey that they have undertaken, their intellect and wit. Trust me, they admire you just as much. <laughs> and with this renewed confidence in our deep mutual respect, be bold about your, about your life choices. Embrace that restless feeling that brought you here. Trust that whatever, whatever life throws at you, you will excel. Second, you have found a family here. Over the past nine months, each of us has at least once felt alone, out of place, like an imposter or simply sad. And the magic happened when people that you, whom you truly admire accepted you, took care of you. We redefined the meaning of friendship and the meaning of home. Home became more than just a physical place, it became the people surrounding us. Our most precious gift, no doubt, is the support network we created. The friends who understood and embraced our quirks and who whenever we needed would surprise us with nothing but, happen but kindness and happiness. And now on to my challenge. Easy is not dancing in Volver. <laughs> I challenge each and every one of you that whenever we remember each other, may it be an article or a joke, text, text, or even better, call that person. I challenge you to visit at least once the 27 countries here represented and of course, you only need t money for the air tickets. You have air free Airbnbs for life. <laughs> Didn't you read the small print at the acceptance letter? <laughs> Lastly, I challenge that whenever any of us needs help, 
You do everything in your power to be there for them. Together, we are unstoppable. And with that, congratulations to the brilliant Stanford LLM SPUs and GSD class of 2023. May our paths be paved with success, our hearts filled with purpose, our bones unbreakable. Thank you, and thanks, ChatGPT, for this touching and corny closing statement. In other words, dale con todo, cabrones! Hello, Stanford Law School class of 2023! My name is Eduardo Gonzalez. And I'm Royce Chang. And we stand before you, the proud children of immigrant parents from... South Korea. La Ciudad de México. And Nicaragua. And we are so, so honored, honored to, to be, be here. here. <laughs> now, some of you asked us to speak today because you think we're hopeful and optimistic. And some of you asked to speak, oh, sorry. <laughs> and some of you would have preferred a speech by literally anyone else because you think we're hopelessly optimistic. And some of you just want your 1L student activities fees finally refunded. To all, to all of you, we say, sorry to disappoint. We have no refunds. And as for optimism, well, we started our law school careers in unprecedented circumstances. <laughs> Biblical fires and plague, business school students cavorting on Wilbur Field, <laughs> claiming to be law students, that's Wilbur Gate, <laughs> and yes, doing our entire school year from our bedrooms on Zoom. And on our way out, a federal judge screamed in our faces. Sorry, folks, it turns out that the one thing that ChatGPT can't do is generate false hope. What we can offer you today is our story, unfolding over three years and many miles of stretched metaphors. Because you see, they say that you never forget how to ride a bike. Because balance becomes muscle memory and one foot knows to follow the other. They don't tell you what you're supposed to do if you forget. Believe it or not, my classmates will laugh about this. I actually taught myself to ride a bike when I was 16 years old. <laughs> Unlike my younger brothers, I was too scared to remove those training wheels when I was a kid. It turns out that fear is something, something else you don't forget, although it takes different shapes. Before law school, I spent several years working in the restaurant industry at Kamado Sushi in Berkeley. One day, while hesitantly preparing the fish for service, one of the chefs grabbed my hand and said, you need, to use this, you need to use the knife sin miedo, without fear, and some other colorful language. Yes, you might mess up one fish, he said, but it's the only way you'll learn. And while I was still careful not to mess up too many fish, and I think my chef owner is here somewhere, um, I promised myself that I would learn to embrace mistakes, not as failures, but as learning opportunities. I promised that this would become muscle memory, like one foot in front of the other, and that I wouldn't forget. Still, the thing is, it can be hard to imagine law school as a safe place to embrace mistakes as opportunities, no matter what the glossy admissions pamphlets say. The stakes are high right from the beginning. You have to choose which gold stars to pursue, which doors to close. You have to compete with everyone in every class. And let me tell you, it's not been fun being on a damn curve with y'all. <laughs> I thought I learned to carry on sin miedo. I thought it was muscle memory, like riding a bike. 
But law school reinforces a fear, a fear of failure so strongly that I almost did the impossible. I almost forgot. Poetically, I learned to ride the bike again in law school, thanks to this guy and a lot of our friends. And by that, I mean two things. First, literally, now I huff and puff up and down the hills around here in spandex or lycra. But more importantly, I mean that I relearned the small things that I thought I'd never forget. Compassion and radical self-kindness. Law school of all places is a strange place to do this. I mean law school, radical self-kindness, radical anything. <laughs> law school feels like an unapproachable space that wasn't designed for many of us, and it's exhausting when you don't fit in. But in spite of that, it was here that I learned to be okay, thanks to many of you and professors and staff. Um, learn to be okay with falling down and picking myself back up, to seek help from others, and to give myself the same care as it would to gently help a kid get back on their bike. These are the small things that give us our balance, and in our profession, they are more important than ever, because even if we feel out of place, even when we make mistakes, we have to keep going and make space for ourselves. Sin miedo. Royce, <laughs> you put into practice a lesson that my parents have been teaching me my entire life. And that's to show up and to treat each and every day like it's your first. It means finding joy in beginnings and being patient with yourself like it was your first ride every day. But there is a problem with living that way. Uh, if you treat every day like it's your first, um, you get hurt. And each time hurts like the first. When I came here to SLS, I believed in something. I was hopelessly optimistic. Something changed. Turns out that some case law is just code for power. Equal protection can feel like a tired slogan. And many in the profession seem to fold like cheap suits every time they have to choose between power and people. I was on a bike ride when I finally admitted to a friend law school itself had made me cynical. I didn't think my hope was the kind of thing that I could forget. I must have dropped it somewhere along the ride. What do you do when you forget the little things you thought you couldn't, like hope? Naturally, I demanded answers from an admired professor over donuts and coffee at Coho. I asked him what had kept him going through years of defeats and setbacks. He said this, Eduardo, just think about every moral gain, every victory at law, every good change our society has ever seen. All of those things happen because of people fighting the battles of their day. But, he said, in their moments of history, none of them had any idea if anything would get better either. Nothing was guaranteed to them, to any of us, in any lifetime, but someone, somewhere, showed up and went to work anyway. My professor told me this and said, so why not us? Of course, we have no idea if things are going to get better either. Neither did they. Someone fought for you. Someone fought for me. Someone fought for every single person sitting under this tent. And we might never get the chance to thank them, but maybe we can fight for someone else. I'm not saying that all of my cynicism is gone. It's not. And I know that difficult days are ahead when courts and the Supreme Court will strip rights from millions and when my hope will feel as easy to forget as it was to learn. When those days come, I'll think about standing right here under this tent next to Royce, with all of you. I will think of learning to let ourselves fail, learning to let ourselves grow, and to let ourselves start over. Of course, we have no idea what's coming just around the corner, but that is no reason to not get back on the bike and keep on pedaling. In closing, thank you to all the families, friends, and partners here today for supporting every member of our class throughout these three years. 
Thank you for putting up with us. What a ride it's been. And class of 2023, it's all downhill from here. Good afternoon. My name is Nick Shiva. And I'm Gustavo Shofai. And we are delighted to stand before you today to honor the recipients of the Graduating Class Awards. The Dean's Award for Excellence in Service recognizes a graduating student who has made distinctive and exceptional contributions to legal education or the quality of student life at Stanford Law School. The contributions may be made for activities such as program development, commitment to volunteer activities, public service and pro bono work, student organization leadership, or clinical education. Selecting this year's award recipient was an easy decision, as one remarkable individual emerged as an exemplar in all of these areas. Her active and sustained efforts to enrich the law school community reflect the, prin the principles and standards of excellence of Stanford Law School. On top of being a bright presence in the classroom and an amazing teaching assistant, she has served as an executive editor of both Stanford Law Review and the Stanford Journal of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, president of Stanford Youth and Education Advocates, academic chair of Stanford Black Law Student Association, a clinic member of the Youth and Education Law Project, and even shined as one of the stars of the law school musical. <laughs> However, beyond her remarkable accomplishments, it is her character that truly distinguishes her. She embodies kindness and thoughtfulness in every interaction, reaching into the lives of countless individuals who have had the privilege of knowing her. Her genuine care for others is evident in her bright presence within our community, where she inspires and uplifts her peers, and I'm so glad to be able to call her a friend. It's with great excitement and pride that I announce Laura Henderson as a recipient of this year's Dean's Award for Excellence in Service. Please join. Please join me in recognizing her outstanding achievements and expressing our sincere appreciation for the profound impact she has made on our community. Congratulations, Laura. I got some remarks. Thank you, Nick. That was very kind and unwarranted. Um, good morning, everyone. <laughs> okay, they told me to keep my remarks brief, uh, so I'm going to try to do my best. Um, most of you know that's not exactly my strong suit, but um, I'm going to try. Um, I spoke to a lot of you about the best way to approach this, um, the best way to express my sincere gratitude for the time that I've got to spend here and the people that I've got to spend it with. The best way to thank the professors and staff members who have provided me with lessons and grace when I felt I deserved none of those things. The best way to bring up Dean Steinbach and the community she upheld without getting my microphone turned off. I asked her what's the best way to get through this without crying too much, but I came prepared. <laughs> All of you told me to just be myself, uh, which isn't particularly helpful for the crying thing, but um, I guess I will. Um, so my hot take on law school has always been that I love it here. <laughs> Did you just boo me? <laughs> um, it has been so hard, um, and it has been unfair and we have lost so much and too many. But in spite of all that, I have loved it here because of all of you. So I guess that's my big takeaway from all of this. I don't have a charge or anything for you because people are always gonna do what they're gonna do. But I hope that each of you has gotten to experience beauty even in the bleakest moments here. 
And I hope that wherever you go next, you find community that will hold you up. And that if you can't see the beauty or you don't feel the community, then you either make it or you leave. Because at the end of the day, all we have is each other. Oh, just on time. <laughs> I'm just really grateful that I got to have all of y'all. Thank you. Congratulations, everyone. The staff award is given by the graduating class to the staff person, administrator, or faculty member who has played an integral role in the lives of the graduating students. I'm excited to recognize an individual who embodies the spirit wholeheartedly. Mike Wynn is the director of pro bono at the John and Terry Levin Center for Public Service and Public Interest Law. And for those of us who may occasionally grown weary of the courses taught by the exceptional faculty behind me, we were fortunate to find solace in Mike's guidance as he also oversees the law school's externship program. Mike's unbridled enthusiasm for promoting pro bono work has had a profound impact, not only on our own lives, but also on the larger community. As you peruse through the commemorative pamphlet you've gotten, you will notice asterisks placed next to the names of many graduates. These asterisks symbolize the countless hours of pro bono service completed by Stanford Law School students. It is in no small part due to Mike Wynn's unwavering support and guidance that these accomplishments have been made possible. Moreover, it is worth acknowledging that Mike's influence extends beyond his professional achievements. He has an earned place in the heart of the Public Interest Community Center, where an appliance dear to all of us bears his name. <laughs> Microwave Wynn stands alone as a testament to the deep admiration and affection we hold for him. Please join me in expressing our heartfelt appreciation for the impact he has made on our journey through Stanford Law School as we recognize Mike Wynn as this year's recipient of the Staff Award. Congratulations, Mike. Way too much, way too much. Um, I am just completely flush with gratitude. It has been um, such an amazing three years, um, and I feel lucky to have spent this time with you. I often say, and I mean it earnestly, that uh, one of the core elements of my job here is to take credit for all the amazing work you do. And so it's no surprise that this year I'm up here accepting this on your behalf. <laughs> So I do stand on lots of shoulders. I want to give um, some shout outs in that regard. First and foremost, to all of you, the class of 2023, 121 of you are graduating with pro bono distinction. Um, and, and beyond that, um, you have stepped up in just miraculous, um, incredibly generous ways to stand with our communities. When workers in this state um, were discriminated against or underpaid, you stood with them. When uh, low-income homeowners in Detroit were uh, being threatened with tax foreclosure, you got on a plane and stood with that community. You have shown over and over again the incredible spirit that you bring to this profession and one that desperately needs it. I also want um, to thank all of our partners in this work, um, especially nonprofits and their attorneys, advocates, community organizers, and other staff members who toil day after day to connect with communities in need, understand how we might be able to stand with them, develop amazingly effective strategic ways to provide legal assistance, and then beyond that, to find, figure out and design systems that get you all and me involved on a day-to-day -day basis. They are incredible. Two more thanks to the Associate Dean of Public Service and Public Interest Law, Diane Chin. Uh, I certainly wouldn't be here um, if not for you, but you have been a transformative force for good here at this law school and in the world, and it's an honor and a pleasure to share this. 
stage with you. Uh, finally, um, I want to thank, um, oh, I want to reveal something. That's what I wanted to do. Because I feel like, um, me and you are taking a little bit more time than brief. Um, I, uh, I feel like I, uh, this might be a good moment to um, confess. Uh, and so this may be my last uh, day on the job. Um, I've been living a lie. So uh, um, uh, years ago, 17 years ago to be exact, I was preparing um, to sit in very similar chairs that you're in right now. Uh, and at that point, I had accumulated a total of um, zero hours of pro bono service. <laughs> too much, right? It's too much to reveal? OK, beyond brief. I, um, I, uh, I had an ax to grind in law school. Um, uh, I uh, was a perennial underachiever. And I um, spent my time gobbling up gold stars. Um, and that um, led me to an offer at a big firm in New York City. Um, but as I was preparing to sit in these chairs, I got news um, from my mom that my grandfather, Tadeusz Szakowski, um, who was a Nazi prisoner for most of World War II and spent his entire career afterwards in public service arguing to anybody who would listen or not listen uh, for enduring peace and equal justice, that he was sick. She was with him. She said, he might not have much longer. So I got on a bus and a train and a plane, and I sat with my grandfather for his two final days. Uh, and after that, arranged his funeral and flew back just the night before my graduation. After I graduated and passed the bar, I started my job at a big firm. And I think I had been waiting all of that time for some kind of instruction from him, some kind of guidance as to how I can serve. Um, I didn't uh, come up with any amazing ideas, but that instinct to ride a bike was there. I think we all have it to help. How do we make things better with our careers? And so on my second day at the firm, after a day of orientation, I took the elevator to the 30 foot floor, 33rd floor. I went into the office of our pro bono coordinator, and I asked, how can I help? And I spent four years dedicating so much of my time to that work. It drew me to a career in public interest. And then, of course, here with all of you. Um, so for all of you who are graduating with public jurisdiction, I am in awe, and I've been in awe of your work. But I also know from experience that we will have multitudes of opportunities to use our skills and this degree to bring good and justice to this country and this world. I am so pumped and excited to be a part of it um, and grateful for this opportunity to be with you. So thank you. Hi everyone, it is with great honor that I stand before you today to present the 2023 John Herbert Award for Excellence in Teaching. This prestigious recognition is granted to a person who strives to make teaching an art. This year's awards celebrates and acknowledges the exceptional qualities and dedication of Professor Gregory Avlaski. Professor Avlaski has left a permanent mark on the SLS community through his passion for teaching and his genuine care for the well-being of all. What sets Professor Ablaski apart it is, is not only his outstanding teaching skills, but also his ability to connect with everyone. His support and mentorship extend far into the personal life of the students. Whether it's offering guidance during difficult moments or providing a sympathetic ear, he is always there to help the students navigate the challenges of law school and their, to find their true potential. Furthermore, Professor Ablaski's impact reach, reaches beyond the boundaries of academia. Through his work at the UROC Policy Lab, he actively contributes to important social and legal causes and inspires students to make a meaningful difference. In the words of one of his students, the question is not, do I deserve this? It is what I'm going to do with this for others. You don't walk through life as worthy or unworthy. You earn it along the way. 
So please join me in congratulating Professor Ablaski on this well-deserved honor. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Gustavo. So the first comment I got from people when I received this honor was, didn't you just do this? <laughs> uh, I got a slight variation on this from my wife who said, I'm not going to graduation again. <laughs> so some people told me I should just reuse my speech from a few years ago since none of you were here. Uh, and the people up here were, but they don't remember what I said. Um, actually, so Marissa Lowe, apparently this campaign about student activities fees is ongoing because Marissa Lowe also told me to make sure to include that she wants her 1L student activity fee <laughs> refunded in the speech. It's the theme. Um, but I'll confess, the, the world actually looks pretty different now than it did when I did this four years ago. Um, part of this, as the 1Ls continually remind me, is that I'm getting older. They tell me memes are no longer cool. We've moved on to TikToks. Um, but I also thought back about all the things that have happened since you arrived at SLS. I thought back to the first time that I taught any of you. It was January 5th, 2021. The class was, of course, virtual, the way everything was then, since we were at the height of the pandemic. I was actually sitting at my in-law's dining room table in Virginia. You were all boxes uh, on Zoom, sometimes faces, or even worse, the dreaded black boxes. And then literally the next day, insurrectionists hopped up on a false narrative of a stolen election, invaded the US Capitol. Two days later, I flew back to California. When I landed and turned on my phone, I learned that our beloved colleague, Professor Deborah Rohde, an SLS institution, the second woman on the law faculty, and a friend to generations of Stanford students and faculty had passed away. Your 2L year, we returned to in-person instruction, though all masked and with a bewildering array of contradictory rules. <laughs> and then in January, just over a year after D Professor Rohde's passing, Dylan Simmons, a 3L, died, leaving another deep wound in the law school community. And finally, for the JDs, your 3L year arrived, while for many of the LLMs, you arrived at SLS for the first time. Life in the law school slowly returned closer to the before times. And fortunately, it proved to be the calm, peaceful, uneventful year <laughs> that we all needed. And parents, if you're wondering why everyone is asking, you heard a little bit about this already, but ask your, ask your children. All of which is to say the last three years have been hard, and I think they call for a different speech from the one that I gave four years ago. Now, I'm under no illusions about why I'm up here. I know that one of the reasons people like my courses is because I have a reputation for being nice and for having fun classes. I mean, I get it. Have you had any other SLA classes in which one of the questions on on call was to explain the Nickelodeon game show, Legends of the Hidden Temple? <laughs> And I think that this silliness serves an important purpose in the classroom, but I'm also reminded of a quote in a play that I once saw. Actually, it was a musical. N not a musical that featured a giant dancing learned hand costume. Uh, it was not that cool. Uh, it was Stephen Sondheim's Into the Woods. Uh, and here I should say, my wife drags me to a lot of Sondheim musicals, particularly Into the Woods, which is perhaps her favorite. Um, but as we've already established, she's not here. Uh, so I can safely reveal to only a few hundred of my closest friends that actually I was learning things while I was there. So here's the quote. After being deceived by the big, wet, big bad wolf, Little Red Riding Hood sings, nice is different than good. I've been thinking a lot about those words, in particular what it means to do good in a world of profound loss and rancor. Now, you've already encountered one model of how to do good in the law. I spoke about our first class together, but the very first time I met some of you was fall 2020 during orientation when we discussed Brian Stevenson's book, Just Mercy. For those of you who haven't read it, Brian is a heroic attorney who works against insurmountable odds to help free people on death row in Alabama. 
And the whole time I thought about what Professor Rabia Belt once observed to me, that Brian really needs to take up yoga or something. I mean, you're exhausted just reading it. <laughs> so now that you are on the other side of law school and we have your tuition dollars and apparently your activity fees, <laughs> I can admit the cold, hard truth to you. We lied to you. You will not become Brian Stevenson. Michael B. Jordan will not play you in a blockbuster film. You will not stand alone for justice against a cruel system. Obviously, I would love to be proved wrong, but here's what I predict with some confidence will actually happen to you. Whatever you do, whether you do public interest work or work in private sector or in the government or in academia, you will find yourself embedded in a set of complex institutions. You will play a role. With luck, you will get good at that role, prove yourself, build networks. And as that happens, you will assume or have thrust on you ever more responsibilities and obligations. Now, what this looks like day to day is that there will be some set of tasks that await you, your never-ending to-do list, meetings to arrange, things to write, emails to send. Some of them are important. Some of them need to get done right now. Some of them are boring but necessary. Some of them are interesting, like, say, writing a graduation speech. But they are all demands on your time and attention, pulling you in different directions, and they all involve your labor of some sort. And importantly, you will fail. You will shirk some responsibilities and fall short on others. You will disappoint colleagues, friends, and family. This might shock some of you, but even professors Willette and Lemley sometimes drop emails and texts. <laughs> now, I can imagine many of you are thinking this is a particular experience of the privileged and the powerful, and that's right. I suspect this is how many privileged and powerful people feel, and that's what makes it especially relevant to all of you who are in various way, sorts of ways already privileged and will soon have power of different sorts. That privilege and power makes all the more pressing the question that we began with, how to do good in this world of institutions and responsibilities. Now, I do not pretend to have a full answer to this question, but I want to offer you three possible partial answers. First, don't let institutions warp you. What do I mean by this? Well, this is already previewed a little bit by what Gustavo said, but let me start with a key insight that you don't often hear in graduation speeches. None of you deserves to be here. Now, before I feed into any lingering imposter syndrome, <laughs> let me make clear I don't deserve to be here either, and nor does anyone else up on this stage. My point is not that you are not all talented, smart people, and I'm impressed with you and the work that you do every single day. The problem is with the word deserve. It rests on this meritocratic myth, the same one that undergirds the current challenges to affirmative action, that there are certain people who deserve to be at places like Stanford and certain people who don't. And I just do not think that this is true. I have served on both appointments and admissions committees and I've come to see that the decision about who to admit and who to hire is not only necessarily subjective, but only tangentially about the particular person. The outcome turns on luck and balancing different methods and the school's needs in a particular area and the need to build a community. Every so often, I find myself falling into this error of deserving. Honestly, it's pretty easy to do when people are impressed not by you, but just by the role that you play. We might call this the don't you know who I am fallacy. <laughs> and the answer, of course, is just someone who got very lucky. And so instead of deserving, I like to think of earning. That is, if we start from the pre premise that none of us deserves to be somewhere, then the relevant question is, what have you done to earn being there? The second answer to the question of how to be good in an institution is the flip side of the first. Institutions like people will fail and disappoint you. They will fall short. What does that mean for you? We hear a lot these days about complicity and how institutions are tainted by their origins. I'm a historian, as some of you know, and I think a lot about this issue. And I feel of two minds about it. On the one hand, returning to Brian Stevenson, I visited his legacy museum in Montgomery, Alabama last summer. No one, I think, who has toured that museum could deny the clear through line between the brutal white supremacist past and the often brutal, often white supremacist present. 
But on the other hand, I refuse to capitulate to the dead hand of the past. Origins are not destiny, and institutions don't have an essence or a DNA. Let me give you an example. Uh, as Gustavo alluded, along with Professor Liz Rees, I've taken a number of you up to present research to the Tribal Council of the Yurok Tribe, the largest federally recognized native community in California. What would Leland Stanford Sr. think about a member of the Nambe Pueblo and a child of Russian Jewish refugees leading a bunch of native, Latina, white, black, and Asian students to work with a native nation that survived California's genocide? I've read some of Stanford's speeches and I have a pretty good sense, but you know what? He's not here, he's long dead and gone. <laughs> we, in other words, we have to decide what Stanford and other institutions are for today. This is a choice that we have to make. And here, actually, I want to, on this note, just take a moment to honor and recognize Don Baum, the Yurok tribe's general counsel, and a partner in this work who recently passed away just last week. Um, she was a tremendous advocate for Indian country, and she'll be profoundly missed. This brings me to my third and final point, which may be a little bit meta, perhaps appropriately for Silicon Valley. Uh, but it's really just what I've been saying all along. And it is this. At the end of the day, institutions are not real. People are. Look around you. What is Stanford Law School? The buildings, this enormous tent, the Harry Potter robes, <laughs> the delicious hors d'oeuvres that we'll still be, soon be enjoying? It turns out that SLS isn't really much more than the people who have gathered here together as part of a collective endeavor. Now, acknowledging this reality doesn't make things easier. Sometimes, actually, it makes things harder. None of us who have been at SLS this past year need to be reminded that people disagree or that it hurts more when you disagree with people you like and respect, with your friends and mentors and colleagues. For me, this was the most frustrating part of seeing our school be the topic of a gazillion op-eds and hot takes. It completely ignored the reality that everyone involved, whatever their perspective, is an actual person with feelings, and that we are bound together by the fact that we are together, at least for a little while. So this value, which often masquerades under community or collegiality, which feels to me both warm and kind of vague, um, doesn't require agreement. agreement. In fact, I think agreement is often the opposite of respect. And actually, I'm not sure that this value requires respecting one another's positions. Uh, since I've been spilling a lot of secrets today, uh, let me spill one more. Sometimes my very smart colleagues and students hold views that strike me as short-sighted, ideological, or just wrong, prompting long text rants from me. And I suspect, in fact, I know the same is sometimes true of my own views. And perhaps my colleagues have equally text long text rants about me. What I think these disagreements actually require is a different kind of respect, not for opinions, but for people rooted in humility and equality. It requires a recognition of the right of each of us to decisional autonomy. In other words, to be flawed and wrong and still be worthy of belonging. Now, all of this might, see, might make the work that awaits you out in the world seem bleak. But I actually think that this third point, that institutions are, at the end of the day, just people, is a source of tremendous meaning and even joy. So to explain, let me return to that never-ending to-do list that I recounted earlier. When viewed through this lens, all the mundane institutional bureaucratic tasks I described earlier, the emails, the meetings, the letters, the phone calls, they become acts of commitment. In other words, your life will not be split between the tedium of the daily grind and the deep meaning that comes from serving others. It may not feel like it on many days, but they are actually the same thing. Your labor will be a form of love. And that, I would argue, is one way to be good in a constrained and difficult world. I'd like to close with a story that I think illustrates this. A couple years ago, it was my own graduation of sorts, the moment when I received tenure, and my parents came to town. And some of you were there, you may remember, they actually came to my class. And Royce Chang took them aside and thanked them for raising such a kind son. Now, this story says much more about Royce than it does about me, uh, and it explains why he was up here a bit earlier. 
Still, I don't know that my parents have ever been prouder of me than at that moment. Actually, hell, I don't know if I've ever been prouder of me <laughs> than at that moment. So two things. First, I'd like to take this moment to pay Royce's favor forward, to congratulate all of your families on what wonderful and exceptional and kind children they have raised. And I look forward to continuing to do so during the reception. And second, one last bit of honest truth. Looking back, I couldn't tell you what I did that was particularly kind. I just woke up, I held my class, I replied to emails, I met with students. In other words, I did my job just like you soon will be doing yours. Now, I hope that all of you have people as thoughtful and as kind as Royce there to encourage you along the way. But even if you're not so lucky, I hope that nonetheless, you take the time in the midst of everything to appreciate what you're doing. That not just despite, but because of the to-do list and the demands and the responsibilities, despite being enmeshed in often frustrating uh, institutions, you are more than nice. You're doing good, too. Thank you so much for this honor. Thank you, Professor Oblowski. It is now my great privilege to present the degree candidates for the class of 2023. Will the candidates for the Doctor of the Science of Law please stand? Rolando Garcia Miron. Omar Patricio Vasquez Duque. I will now present the candidates for the degree of Master of the Science of Law. Yotam Berger. <laughs> Shuwen Dong. <laughs> Sehi Hong. <laughs> Yu Li. Kaifan Rebecca Ling. <laughs> Georg Frederick Johann Lurens. <laughs> Maria Manuela Palacio Villarreal. <laughs> Alessandra Prespiorski Lemos. Michael Howard Farai Thorburn. I will now present the candidates for the degree of Master of Laws, Corporate Governance and Practice. Alejandro Araujo Gaviria. Medina Arturova. Pratna Baranwal. <laughs> Joanna Joaquim Barreto. <laughs> Christoph Birner. <laughs> Rafael Elu Bresciani. Chun He Roland Chen. <laughs> Luisa Cuelo Guindani. Raimondo De Leon Mendez. Guilherme de Toledo Pisa.
Bond Eke Opara. <laughs> Gustavo Ferrari Shofai. Larissa Santiago Gibrin. Shu Ying Gu. Caroline Bruil. Ryoko Koizumi. Boshing Alice Liu. <laughs> Fabio Moretti de Goiz. Varun Natrajan. Camila <laughs> Otani Nishi. Felipe Procopio Suarez Maya. Shuti Seti. Yasmin Fejera Tejar. Vigilio Teixeira. <laughs> Sofia Tsai. <laughs> Rodrigo Turquio Zacharias. I will now present the candidates for the degree of Master of Laws, Environmental Law and Policy. <laughs> Nathalie Florence Adank. <laughs> Taral Chandrakant Ajmira. <laughs> Julia Braga Ribeiro. Pedro Enrique Clausen Sagner. Manushi Sachajit Desai. Kritzia Yvette Ocampo Fabico. Angela Katrina Kala Feria. Ana Julia Gren Moniz de Aragao. Ragini Gupta. Shu Ning. Takuya Kogashiwa. Vina Kolachina. <laughs> Kelvin Ling. <laughs> Sharon Matthew. <laughs> Valentina Akiko Mendoza Hombo. Nachaya Pichetzata. <laughs> Kiratika Punsom Butlert. <laughs> Sylvia Tsai Shwen Wu. 
Jingja Zhang. I will now present the candidates for the degree of Master of Laws, International Economic Law, Business and Policy. Warbatra Chintramitra. Marina Cuello Reverendo Vidal. Cayo Lucas Crajabra de Almeida. Alejandra Felix Caballero. Heisung Zhang. Satya Ja. Eva Victoria Kadi Keta. Unyoung Kim. Hai Su Kim. Atsushi Kono. Kiara Neroti. Matteo Pistillo. Sabrina Ramos. Luciano Rebagliati Castro. Bruno Cesar Toledo de Conti. Taku Zakoji. I will now present the candidates for the degree of Master of Laws, Law, Science, and Technology. <laughs> Alan Campos Elias Tomas and Friend. Kwan Ling Luisa Chen. Carolina Barbosa de Lima Cunha Vieira da Costa. Veronica Isabel Dibos Nemi. Cheng Yan Du. Pierre Ferrand. Jashashwi Ghosh. Juan Sebastián Gomez Castro. Ashley Taylor Gordon. <laughs> Carolina Herrera Incapié. <laughs> Shin Huang. Abdul Rashid Bolaji Ijaudola. <laughs> Maria Mumbi Kirubi. <laughs> 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 
Mario Kosak Oliveira Paranjos. Andri Rizki Putra. Nikolaus Schröder. Hewan Shin. Alejandra Soler. Anna Starkova. Christine Strauss. Apurva Sundar. Sho Udagawa. Cecilia Zhang. I will now present the candidates for the Doctor of Ju uh, Jurisprudence. Allison I. Aronson. Carolina Jacqueline Abud. Kiyoshi Akira Addison Bell. Daniel James Ahrens. Garrett Medrano Alstad. Bridget Akosua Dufie Amokua. Konedu Abena Suyama Amorokua. <laughs> Megan Anand. <laughs> Julia Ann Anderson. <laughs> Lydia Margaret Bailey. Julia Michelle Barrero. Joshua P. Berenger. Taylor J. Beardall. Sabina Mihaela Beliuz Neagu. Marty Philip Berger. Tess A. Bissell. Afi Blackshear. Meredith Lee Bowen. Daniel A. Bajorquez and friends. Hans Marquez Bridge. Mark David Brunton. Trevor Joseph Byrne. Una Catherine Cahill.
Roger Randolph Kane. Anais Carell. Maura Margaret Carey. Annalise Isabella Castro. Roy Simon Chang. Joy April Chen. Kylie Minji Choi. Robert Jeffrey Chen. Luke Frederick Churchill. Allison Loveshell Cooney. Matthew Allen Cullen. Lauren Elizabeth Davila. Jonathan Ross Deemer. Eric Cle Clement Dupier Nelson. William Alexander Eck. Dakota Campbell Foster. Aaron Matthew Franklin. Erica L. Freeman. Paul Thomas Friedrich. Julia Ann Gleason. Seth Michael Goldman. Jose Luis Gomez Gamez. Eduardo Andres Gonzalez. Hannah Elise Gonzalez. Michelle Claire Gueffin. Carrie Mary Guerin. Neil Guha. August P. Guan. Benjamin Halom. Tanner Christopher Hansen. Shayla Harris. Kate Elizabeth Healy. Elora Ashley Henderson. Anthony Charles Hernandez. Sheena Tiffany Hilton. Elizabeth M. Holland.
Christine Houle. Christopher Robin Huberti. Hannah Celeste Hunt. Adrian Ermer. Julia May Gamble Irwin. Eduardo Daniel Jacobo Ariel. Jenny H. Zhao. Samuel Buckberry Joyce. Carl Hans Kalanius. Grace J. Kavinsky. Sydney J. Curlin Stout. Josh Kermsey. Megan Coyle Parampiel and Friends. Tanner James Kenneth. Catherine Elise Larkin. Natalie Ann Leifer. David Levin. Yi Lee. Cassandra Jennings Lincoln. Marissa Chang Lo. Jared Taylor Lucky. Liana Sophia Lupin. Seamus Gallen Lynch. James Jacob Maddox. Ariane Marcelin Little. Mariah Elise Mastrodimos. Craig Mon. John, Miguel, Macaulay, and friends. Anne F. G. McDonald. Killian H. McDonald. Paula Gabriela Mendez. Jared Charles Milfred. Brianna Erin Middleman. Mohit Mukim. Yasmin Moreno. Jennifer Joan Moroni.
Bridget Riley Morrison. Marnie Loeb Morse. Alistair Murray. Garrett David Muscatel. Wilfred Colton Navarro. Akiva Nemetsky. Ayomide E. Odunsi. Alexander Pecht. Dennis J. Poland. John Ethan Pretty. Enshin Chu. Mark Edward Raftry. Saraswati Pradipsin Rathod. Reja S. Reed. Zachary Daniel Rigo. Grace Ingrid Rehot. Kaysen Jonathan Bingham Riley. Eric Stefan Remaker. Jacob Bernard Rhesus. Alana Rhea Reynolds. Ana Ribadinera. Brianna Alberta Roberson. Andres Rodriguez. Hayden K. Rookley. Jacobo Luis Rothner. Joseph T. Rowley. Esaú Abdiel Ruiz. Ian Edward Sargent. Brendan Stafford Saunders. Jacqueline Schaefer. Jessica Siemens. Catherine Seta. Cicely A. Shannon. Nikhil Shiva. Lillian Grace Siegel. Estizer E. Smith. William Leroy Smith. Sydney Ann Spiesman. Aaron Spiegel.
James D. Stone. Camila Lozada Strassel. Hannah Grace Subega. Uh, Rain Anthony Sullivan. Caroline Ann Sundermeyer. Nathan Vaklov Tauger. Marco Antonio Torres. Ivana Maria Valdez. Sergio Felipe Zanuta Valenti. Robert James Vogt. Raven D. Walker. Samuel Alexander Wallace Perdomo. Madeline Christian Walsh. Lisa Wang. Jack Weller. Connor Scott Worth. Mark Westwood. Kai Stanton Wiggins. Glenn Richard Williams. Justin Michael Williams. Jackson P. Willis. Devin S. Wilson. Sadiki Wilshire. Tess Winston. Mitchell James Wong. Amir Edward Wright. Caroline Graves Wyatt. Jeffrey Xia. Jenny Shin. Peggy Shu. Zijun Sam Shu. Claire Lily Yerman. <laughs> Lihi Yona. <laughs> Vanessa Ray Young Vinegra. <laughs> Daniel A. Zahn. Dean Martinez, assembled faculty and staff, and honored guests, I present to you the Stanford Law Class of 2023. Please join me in congratulating them all.
It's now time to conclude our ceremony so that you can celebrate with your family, friends, classmates. But before you go, it's traditional to conclude with a charge to the class. The purpose of a charge is not just to give you advice, but to entrust you with a duty or responsibility. So here is my charge to you, lead with your humanity. You are embarking on careers which will undoubtedly face marked challenges in coming years. Society is in a period of conflict, uncertainty, and disruption. At the same time, in a world where our interactions are increasingly mediated by technology, it can be easy to lose sight of our common humanity and the respect for human dignity that we owe one another. Advances in technology, indeed some of the new tools created around us in the Bay Area and on this campus, are poised to transform the legal profession and society itself in profound ways. When ChatGPT was released to the public last fall, many of us for the first time really understood how rapidly artificial intelligence may change the way we work. And no, ChatGPT did not write this charge. <laughs> As AI advances and improves, it will enhance various aspects of legal practice while simultaneously presenting new considerations and challenges for society and government. In your first years practicing law, AI-powered algorithms may significantly change the way you as junior attorneys will perform research, review documents and contracts. Within a year or two, you may be able to rely on these tools to identify relevant laws, statutes and precedents, draft documents, minimizing the time you spend on the traditionally most tedious and labor-intensive tasks that all lawyers must do at some point in their careers. Do make sure to double-check that the AI is not making up imaginary cases, as news reports suggest one lawyer in New York recently learned the hard way. Technology is already advancing to assist in case strategy by analyzing patterns and predicting outcomes. You'll need to be flexible and continually open to learning how to use these tools in ways that comply with your obligation as counsel and members of the bar. However promising and exciting these coming changes may be, there's a crucial aspect of legal practice that can never be supplanted by technology. As areas of your practice become more efficient, freeing you up to focus on developing other skills, I urge you to focus on bringing your human judgment, empathy, and critical thinking to your work. You've spent the past three years learning how these aspects of your humanity can inform both how you approach case analysis and your decision-making about what areas of law in which you specialize. This is what will set you apart as practitioners and leaders in your respective fields. As practicing lawyers, you'll be at the forefront as rules and regulations surrounding the use of AI in every aspect of life, not just the practice of law, are developed and implemented. It will be your job and require the exercise of your ethics and moral values to establish frameworks that ensure technology is used responsibly and in alignment with society's values. Your ethical reasoning is what should guide how AI is applied to the practice of law and governance. Likewise, your ability to understand the unique needs of individuals, the nuances of cultural context, and the essence of human emotion that all play a part in how you will determine the best way to represent your clients and advocate for them. Your empathy and understanding of your client's needs and circumstance, your experience as an individual and professional will enable you to assess the implications of a case, weigh alternatives, and exercise discretion, all crucial aspects of the practice of law that technology cannot address. And don't forget that much of the practice of law comes down to what happens in a particular room on a particular day. You'll need to connect in person with judges, juries, experts, and opposing counsel. Your insights as how to how to read a person or a room and tailor your advocacy in a way that you judge to be most effective in the moment is something that cannot be replaced. Moreover, if you've learned anything in your time at SLS, in classes and seminars, clinics and policy labs, pro bono projects and summer jobs, I hope you've internalized that legal rules are not mere abstractions or logic puzzles but systems that have profound implications for individual human beings, families, and communities. Cases and law are ultimately about people. I therefore charge you, the graduates of the Stanford Law School class of 2023, to bring your humanity to the practice of law. We ask that our guests remain seated until our ceremonial recession has exited the tent. You may then find your way to Crocker Garden where the celebration will continue. Please join me in giving another round of applause to the class of 2023.